Thanks, folks. Hey, everybody. Um, those of you that are on the call, I'm excited to share some ICS and OT specific stuff with you. Let me minimize this screen. Um, my name is Vivek Ponada, and here's a quick background of who I am. Um, I've been in uh, industrial control systems all my life. Um, in fact, right after high school, I uh, became a technician, instrument technician, and uh, I graduated with electrical degree uh, later on, but I've been doing ICS um, all my work life. I've been doing OT cybersecurity for the past eight plus years. Uh, most of the past 10 years has been sales and business development. I do uh, dabble a bit on the services and execution. Uh, and, and like many of you um, in the industry that have been around for a while, I've traveled and worked in many countries. Um, I do have a finance uh, MBA as well and a SANS cert for industrial controls. Here's my contact info. And let's dig into the agenda today. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the industrial control systems, the PLCs. Um, uh, we'll talk more about the top 20 uh, PLC coding practices project, and we'll go through some examples. So um, first up, PLCs, folks. Um, nobody is uh, surprised to see Purdue model here. Um, most of the discussion that you see around industrial controls typically starts off with saying, um, how do you protect the um, internet facing devices, right? So anything in the DMZ at this phase, you know, level three above, um, or maybe even the HMIs and historians and EWS at this level two or three, um, even down to uh, level two HMIs. But you don't hear about securely doing anything at this level one or below, because historically, there was no protection, no focus on security at this level one or below. So, in fact, you hear about this term insecure by design because these PLCs, uh, you know, both the hardware and then the protocols, the communication protocols were never built with uh, security in mind. So, uh, if an attacker, a malicious uh, actor is in this area already, you know, having done whatever, uh, you know, lateral movement or, or direct access through some kind of IoT device. Either way, once they're here, uh, they can operate no different from a uh, maintenance person or an operator because, you know, the protocols, they'll just execute whatever commands are given, right? So they don't really look into, you know, who's doing the um, initiation of a command. So historically, again, you know, no encryption, authentication, et cetera. Now we talk about PLCs, but you know what I'm going to talk about today is equally applicable for distributed control systems or you know the SCADA systems as well. Uh, we're just talking about the level one controllers, okay? All right. So next up is the um, background on the top 20 projects. So a couple of years ago at S4, you know, which is a um, OT specific uh, you know, thought leadership kind of cybersecurity conference, happens every year in January in Miami. Um, Jake Brodsky did a presentation talking about how there are things we could do at uh, level one. There are things that we could do to improve the security of PLCs, uh, you know, have a, a better posture, security posture, and also be able to uh, help in, in case there is an issue uh, and, and help in forensics and incident response. He did this presentation um, and then post that a lot of people felt like they should be developed further, you know, beyond the presentation uh, to get like a list that the community can actually use. So um, they then registered on, um, you know, an ISA website uh, and, and solicited people to contribute. About a thousand people, you know, register and several dozens actually contributed for the next year. And after a year, we now have this um, uh, PDF file ready that has the top 20 practices. Uh, I'll post this uh, link again in the Discord channel, but you can download this. Uh, there is no need to register. You just download it and use it as you, as you see fit. But these practices are written for engineers. These are not written for OT practitioners. Of course, OT practitioners um, you know, could use this and pass it on to the engineers, but the key um, reason why we did that was we wanted to, to improve the coding of the PLCs themselves, right? So these engineers that are coding these uh, control systems are whom this is targeted towards. Uh, the goals are, you know, obviously to make the PLC code a little bit more robust or at least less vulnerable. Also, you know, use some of these mechanisms, you know, built-in redundancy, you know, software um, coding buildup, uh, some kind of fallback mechanisms, and also you know, improve the secure by design mechanism. 
and then assistant documentation and logging, et cetera, you know, when you get to an instant response kind of situation. Uh, so we mapped all these practices as much as possible to the minor attack framework for ICS, CWE, you know, ISA standards 62443, as you would expect, right? So that way, you know, we are following industry standards and frameworks, um, but this list is essentially a practices list. It's not a standard by itself. Um, also, it adds a layer of protection in places that none existed before. So uh, thereby the PLC code itself will be less error prone and makes it harder for an attacker uh, to accomplish what they were trying to. That's the goal, you know, one of the goals behind this project. Uh, let's get into this list. So we have these 20 items here. Uh, we're going to take a few examples and elaborate them a little bit more, but um, I just wanted to pause just for a second here so you can see the list of uh, top 20 practices. Again, like I mentioned, I'll, I'll provide the link. You can download this uh, with more detail there. It's like a 40 page document that has all these different um, practices and explains in detail with some examples. All right, let's take, uh, let's go into uh, this list with a simple one first. So one of the practices, uh, practice number two, talks about tracking operating modes. So those of you that are very familiar with industrial control systems, you know, I'm showing a PLC here, you know, with some IO and some power supply. As you can see, um, you have a switch here that typically has uh, multiple modes. One of them happens to be run, the other one would be typically program and maybe remote. So the idea being, uh, when in run mode, the code is being executed by the PLC. When it's in uh, program mode, you're able to download code to the controller. And when it's in remote, uh, you can then choose whether to program or run you know, from a distance uh, via software. So the guidance here from this practice is to say that uh, you know, keep the PLC in run mode. And if it's not in run mode, it should be an alarm to the operator. And you know, again, at the end of the shift, uh, make sure the alarm pops back up because if someone were working on this PLC, um, the operator would know, right? And they would acknowledge it. And then end of the shift, maybe they close the permit out and then you know, enable the PLC to go back to run mode. Now, there are reasons why it's typically left in remote because you know this might be in a hazardous area. Uh, the engineer might need to put on their coveralls and hard hat and safety boots and to get to this area to, uh, you know, or drive even further out somewhere remote to, to access the switch, or maybe call a buddy operator and ask them to you know, put this in, um, in a program or when they need to. But the key is, you know, the malicious attacker doesn't have the buddy operator, doesn't have the access to the PLC, right? So we're trying to avoid the risk of this being in remote and someone over the network being able to move uh, the PLC into program mode and download stuff or cause any dis you know, disturbance to the operation. So the recommendation is to you know, keep this in run mode and always um, alert uh, via an alarm on the HMI if it's not in run mode. Now you might ask the question, you know, there are some PLCs out there that do not have a switch, so what about that? Again, the goal of this practice is to um, uh, kind of give you an example of what we're thinking, what collectively uh, OT practitioners or cybersecurity focused folks are thinking. Uh, you might have to find alternate mechanisms, right? They might be a password that you can um, put to avoid a download or some other way to track, you know, whether the PLC is in a mode that is not running, that is, uh, you know, able to download to the controller. That's what we're trying to avoid um, or alert at the very least, okay? Next up is uh, practice five, another uh, pretty straightforward one. Uh, you know, you, you might see a trend here that some of these things might seem like common sense for IT folks, but then we're in the OT world where um, our common sense is different. Our, what, we, what we developed uh, code for, programming for, uh, is for process um, functionality and efficiency and reliability, not so much for um, security. So. Again, this practice talks about using a cryptographic hash or a checksum to verify the integrity of the PLC code. Now, um, some PLCs do have a uh, checksum feature where they um, automatically generate a checksum and you, you can save it. Maybe you can even put it on a register and uh, alarm it if, it if it changes. But if you don't have that feature, you can still perform the checksum pretty easily on the engineering workstation, right? 
or you can probably do a hash in the AWS of the binary that you just downloaded. So you know that it's the one through code that you are in control of and no one messed with it. So most PLCs can't generate or, or check hashes on their own. So you have to do that from the engineering workstation. So again, the key is to um, ensure that you're able to verify the integrity of the code, okay? Next up is um, practice seven. Again, I'm just going through some of the examples so that you get a feel for what these PLC practices are, are doing, right? This happens to be one of my favorite ones where it says validate and alert for paired inputs and outputs. So the way we define these paired inputs are these are things that physically cannot happen at the same time. So as an example, a valve cannot be open or close at the same time, right? Or a motor wouldn't have a start or a stop command uh, and a stop command at the same time. So um, that way, if a malicious attacker is trying to just you know, mess with outputs or mess with inputs, you should have a mechanism to say, this is physically not possible, right? So these two signals shouldn't be coming in at the same time. Now, they might be coming because of a limit switch fault or some kind of MCC failure, but having this alert kind of tells you that there's something going on out in the field that you need to inspect or, or troubleshoot, right? That's the idea. Now, um, you know, if possible, I'm using a ladder logic example here, you know, typically you have this motor, start command, uh, if it goes away, uh, then it's stop, right? Uh, but what we're saying here is configure start and stop separately if at all possible. That way it's two different outputs going to the MCC. And if the MCC is able to take those two separate inputs for motor start and stop, that's ideal. And then disallow the rapid change of output states, meaning uh, if some malicious attacker is able to just force this motor start or stop, um, on and off, on and off, right? Um, you should have some kind of software timeout or something that disables the output, uh, you know, from being toggled pretty quickly. Now, uh, you might ask the question, you know, wouldn't the attacker then find, go back in logic and check where that's being stopped and override it? Yes, it's possible. But again, the key is we're trying to improve the code, right? We're trying to increase the robustness of the code, not necessarily mitigate every single possible attack scenario, uh, but make it harder for the attacker, make them read the code even further than they already did so far, or not able to just randomly toggle outputs or bits from a Modbus access they have on the network, for example. All right, let's go into another um, slightly more detailed one. So this is um, uh, validate inputs based on plaus you know, the physical plausibility. Um, this is actually cool because you know, PLC gets a lot of inputs, right? It gets, uh, you know, not only the process inputs, it gets all the pressures, temperatures, limits with feedback, many things, right? Um, so if you monitor the expected physical duration, as an example, there's a valve, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to go from fully closed to fully open, or a tank with a certain fluid uh, it takes certain time to you know, either completely drain or completely fill up. You got to have a good feel for what these numbers are in a usual process scenario and then alert when they're different, right? So if someone was um, attacking the bits maliciously or manipulating the transmitter um, signal, the 420 milliamp signal, or, um, you know, coming from uh, level three below, you know, just uh, modify some packets or, or, you know, replay attack of, of using some past inputs to, uh, to force inputs currently. Uh, if you track, if you track this uh, physical duration of what it should be currently in this process, and if it's different, if you get an alert, that's a good way to kind of find out if something is wrong with the process or if someone is manipulating it, right? Similarly, you know, monitor expected the uh, physical repeating activity. So some of these uh, wastewater treatment plants have a diurnal cycle where, uh, you know, you, something's happened in the morning, something's happened at night. Now, if whatever should happen in the morning is happening at night, uh, that's atypical, right? Again, alert based on that, alarm based on that. So the operator has an idea. And the last one, uh, if you all remember, you know, the most recent Oldsmar, uh, Florida, a, a hop where um, someone not only used a remote access to, to log in, uh, which is a traditional IT vulnerability that we all know, you know, remote access credentials, stolen credentials, but they were also able to um, enter a value uh, for lie, you know, which was ten, tens of thousands of times more than, you know, what the actual uh, lie percentage should be, 
right? Now, if you limit the operator entry for set points to what is practical and physically possible, uh, that wouldn't happen, right? Now, there are many mitigations. So some of the uh, practices, some of the other practices also have other mitigations for the remote access, for example, or some of the validation and checks on the PLC code. But in this particular case, um, the, the key is to allow, for example, let's say the whole process can only take 5% lie safely uh, in an hour, you should only let the operator enter up to that 5%, right? You shouldn't, just because there is a number on the HMI that they can enter, um, shouldn't be the reason why they have a, a chance to enter 10% or 20%. So that, what, that avoids mistakes being made at the same time, um, this allows the malicious attacker, you know, accessing the same input from anywhere else uh, and entering a number that's not physically possible, okay? That's another cool way to kind of mitigate some of the external threats. Uh, this is another interesting example where you trap false negatives and false positives for critical alerts. You wouldn't do this for all alerts, but uh, let me walk you through a scenario. So let's say this is a... Um, um, you know, obviously, we have many kinds of programming languages, right? So we have function block, we have ladder logic. Uh, this could be a function block example where you have a bunch of conditions and they all have to be true to get this trigger bit as one, okay? And this trigger bit one can then go on and do other things, maybe start stops and pumps, uh, you know, do some other activity in the PLC. But what if uh, a malicious attacker was uh, forcing this trigger bit to zero? on purpose, right? So that the rest of the actions or the sequence doesn't happen. So in this example, we're trying to create an alert for this kind of false negative, right? So this is supposed to be one, but someone uh, maliciously forced it to zero. So if you build an additional piece of logic where you actually take the output of the same um, AND gate here, and then take a not of this trigger bit uh, that was forced in, in our example, and then AND it to get this alarm, uh, in a forced condition, you know, this would be zero, that means this would be one, and this is already one, so you then get this alert that, hey, there is a false negative happening on this particular trigger bit, okay? You can do something similar for a false positive as well. Again, the key is, you know, we're trying to add another layer of protection where you could make an argument that an attacker would not only force this, but also force this. That's possible, definitely, but this code normally doesn't exist, right? So many of these things that we're recommending in these practices list, you know, based on a lot of experience over uh, many years uh, by many um, PLC engineers and practitioners is that the more um, robust you build a code and the more um, uh, kind of checks you built in, uh, the more difficult it is for a malicious attacker to just randomly get lucky and be able to manipulate something. So this false negative will alert you that uh, you know someone is forcing this bid uh, on purpose. Next up, um, you know, we have several practices that I kind of combined to say these are kind of similar where you monitor, uh, whereas the previous practices we talked about were all about verifying integrity. Um, some of these practices are more for monitoring. So for example, let's take this first one, PLC cycle time. I'm using this example here where, you know, the PLC cycle time is fairly predictable, right? Because it's a deterministic um, uh, computer. Um, the process is fairly stable. Um, the IOs and, and everything that's being scanned, you know, there'll be minor variation, but let's say there's a spike in this. It's uh, possible that someone injected some malicious code that acts once in a while and causes more CPU cycle time. Uh, if you trend it on the HMI, then you know over time what's uh, normal and what's not, right? So most PLCs have the cycle time uh, allowed to be a trendable point, uh, defined point, but most HMIs don't have this information. So the recommendation here is to do that so that you can track it. So the operator has a better view for what's what's normal and what's abnormal. Same thing with uh, PLC hard stops. If a PLC ever um, you know, does a reset or a reboot, you should be able to log that and record it. Um, and also PLC uptime. It's kind of like the um, alternate for the hard stop, right? So uh, when was the last time the PLC started and how long has it been running? Um, again, that should be something that should be logged. 
and um, same thing with the memory usage. So the, P, um, the PLC memory usage is fairly constant, fairly stable. And if it's changing for a reason, it's likely that someone is messing with, um, uh, with the code or it might be something wrong with the, the device itself or something else wrong in the system. Um, these monitoring ideas or, or these practices are, are crucial during incident response because oftentimes, um, you know, you walk into a plant after an incident and you have no idea uh, what's actually normal, what's good for the process, what's expected, what's not expected. But if you're able to log and trend them on the HMI and then even store them on the uh, workstation or on the on the historian, you then have a way to kind of verify, you know, some of the previous practices we talked about verifying the code and validating the integrity of the binary that you downloaded the code to the, to the controller. Uh, and if you assist this with this kind of data to say, this is normal, and you know whatever is happening now is not normal. So if you have the comparison, then you know you can really do a better instant response because you have a, a good feel for what's what's normal, what's not abnormal, what's abnormal. Um, this project is ongoing; it's evolving. Um, the version one that's published on the PLC-security.com website. Uh, we're always looking for more contributors. We're looking for more people to get involved in the project. Um, if you are an OT practitioner, I would request that you um, pass on this information to your ICS engineers, people that you're working with across the plant floor or in headquarters. Uh, and you yourself can contribute to the project along with those ICS engineers, either with the PLC knowledge or you know, any of the standards work, uh, the ISC, ISC uh, 62443 or the CWE. Uh, we are in, we're seeing a lot more people interested in uh, natively improving the functionality on the level one devices. You know, the more um, recent devices have some kind of built-in encryption, they have more authentication options, but these practices are meant for uh, even older PLCs. So um, if you invest a little bit of time, you'll be able to improve the security posture and help incident response on even older PLCs with these practices. But the key is to educate these clients, you know, our customers, your customers, on the existence of these coding practices. These did not exist before, right? So if someone asked you, hey, how could I better defend level one? You didn't have a good answer. But now these practices exist and uh, you can pass them on this document. Similarly, you know, if you're buying something new in the OT world, uh, don't restrict yourself to um, level two or above. Um, requirements, right? Um, those you know coming from IT, uh, a lot of uh, IT-like requirements are being passed on to OT, you know, whether it's about patching or virtual um, computers. A lot of um, relatively recent developments in the OT world have been restricted to the level two and above, you know, learning from IT. But pass on these requirements, you know, don't just give them this document to say, follow these because this is not a standard, but the concepts behind these practices. Uh, please pass on this uh, document to them, giving them the, the, the background that it's the intent behind these practices. Here's what we're trying to defend. And here are some of the examples of how you do it in an Allen Bradley PLC or a Triconix or a G PLC. So uh, put them in the uh, vendor RFQs and uh, you know, ask for more security at level one and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. That's the end of uh, my presentation. Awesome. Whenever I hear about PLCs, it always just brings me back to like Darknet Diaries talks of like Uber APT hacks and stuff like that. It's the first thing that comes to mind. I can't remember the episode, but I literally just listened to it. Uh, how'd you get into this type of security originally? So uh, my background is industrial control systems. Back when uh, I started, I was a controls instrumentation technician. So there was no security focus like 20 years ago, right? Because we just did everything based on functionality, reliability, how to get the process to um, you know improve. But then don't chuckle, but Stuxnet changed the world. <laughs> you know, if, someone was, if someone was doing a, a bingo, then they were like, yeah, they're waiting for it. But the reality is, uh, you know, the 
average Joe like me, you know, did not think about PLC or industrial security before then. But mm -hmm. uh, since then, the interesting thing is the APT-like uh, behavior um, so far from what we know has only happened five times uh, mm -hmm. in the industrial security world. So the past decade, uh, there, is a, um, there is a group of people, uh, significant experience, a lot of knowledge that say we should not focus on these APTs because so far they've only been five attacks versus thousands of attacks off, you know, ransomware type or mm -hmm. IT like, you know, that happen every second, right? And a colonial pipeline is a good example. Yeah. Old Smart Florida is another example. You see these, you know, remote um, access credentials being dumped on, you know, whatever, some kind of watering hole attack and, you know, got some information or, uh, you know, two-factor authentication not being used, something goofy, something simple that an average IT person would be like, why in the world, like this is 2021, like why are we not doing these basic things is the question, right? But those things happen routinely, but, um, you know, the APT like, you know, long range attack needing, you know, access to level one or, or um, some kind of jumping the air gap environment and, and beyond the DMZ, Th those things can happen. But, you know, for the average company, you know, whether it's, uh, I say average, even bigger companies like Colonial or, or JBS or whoever, uh, most of the attack scenarios are not at level one. So they are mostly coming from the internet facing, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, some kind of cloud bucket that's misconfigured or, you know, some kind of IT like issue that, you know, like, you know, yeah. it's happening every second and, and that's, that'll continue to happen in that world. So o OT, um, you know, is, is not immune to OT specific attacks. Uh, we're not saying that at all, but the, the attack surface is much bigger coming in from the IT. We're working from a threat intelligence field. I wonder how many attacks have actually occurred that no, that have just been swept under the rug too, right? Like I feel five is so low. There has to be a decent amount out there that everyone's like, you know what? No one talk about this. Uh, we don't it's want to start happened, to right? Right? Yeah, nothing happened. We, there's no logs. There's no way to prove it. Well, it, it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, these are all cyber physical systems, right? So of these five, you know, when you think about crash override or, you know, Havex or uh, even Stuxnet, there is usually a physical device or physical process that got disrupted at the end. And that's how you tend to know. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's possible that, uh, you know, everyday industrial uh, plants go through outages and, if it's because of some kind of liability issue or if it's because of some instrument failure or mechanical issue or mm -hmm. you know malicious attacker doing something on their own we wouldn't know unless they tell us but usually there is a cyber physical element at the very end that's disrupted so you you would think you would know like it's hard to um escape from that fact like you would ask the question hey there's a flare you know I, I used to work in houston and there's a flare on the east side of the ship channel like what happened well they have to give you an answer that, hey, you know, we, we screwed up, you know, somebody did some uh, mistake and, and so we, we had to flare or, you know, this device failed and so we had to flare or whatever, right? So um, now, of course, I haven't heard saying, oh, we were attacked <laughs> and so that's why we were flaring, but that's possible, you know, that might be uh, this decade, right? So it didn't happen last decade, it doesn't mean the future will follow what we, what we <laughs> saw in the last year. I think that as a deterrent, just because it hasn't happened, it probably won't happen. It's like, just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it's not going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Well, no one's come after us yet, yeah, but the day is coming. The target pull is lessening yeah. every day. Right. Oh my goodness. Right. But that's the interesting piece. If you look at a lot of vendors selling security products, it's hard for them, right? Because, uh, you know, if you walk into a C-suite and say, hey, here's my product that'll, that'll save you from X, but the X hasn't happened yet. Uh, you know, how do you get funding for that X, right? So that's why, you know, I, I work for a vendor as well. And uh, what we focus on is, uh, you know, the current attack surface, right? And you mentioned threat intel, you know, follow the money, right? So what is threat intel telling us? Where are the exploits right now? Well, they happen to come from, um, you know, remote access or some kind of VPN or, uh, you know, some kind of credential theft focus on that today. Oh, by the way, while you're at it, if you're improving your security posture, buy a tool or a suite of tools that you can expand into OT that can protect you on these other possible scenarios. That way, you know, you're not starting from scratch 
if you wake up one day and you notice maybe in your industry or in a sister industry that something similar, yeah, because these PLCs could be used in so many industries, right? From healthcare to transportation, to power, to oil and gas. So just because something did not happen in power or oil and gas, doesn't mean we cannot learn from something that already happened in healthcare or mm -hmm. in transportation. So absolutely. The other common thing I see is that people don't really know their own mitigation arsenal well enough. They don't know the capabilities of everything that they have. So like, oh, we need a solution for this. And it's like, well, did you know that the thing you have literally has that capability if you would just turn it on or pay for the extra service or whatever. So people are out there not even fully utilizing the benefits of the things they already have. And so you might not need to go out and get something or you might have the ability to plug a hole where you just haven't realized it yet. Or people don't properly deploy things in the first place. They don't get those sessions with those like support engineers. They don't um, you know, sign up for the proper onboarding. They just want to take it out of the box and plug it in and spin it up. And do I see assets in there? This is so fun, super cool. We'll work on tuning that later. And then they never do it. Those manuals are long and boring, all right? No one wants to read those. Like, Guess who's reading them? Me. Like, <laughs> Red teamers. Wait, Red teamers are reading them. The security manuals. That's what I got to do before I wade through the logs. Yeah, y'all are awesome in that uh, you know, red team always trying to help the blue teamers, right? About you know what, what the holes are. I think the biggest gap we have is time and, and resources, right? There's only so many things. Like the average controls engineer in a typical refinery that I know of is dealing with a hundred different control systems in a yeah. given day. A hundred. I'm not even joking, right? And um, you know, they're they're not looking to um improve on security they're just trying to maintain the plant and have the plant reliably operate so they're not thinking about security every given second so we need to fundamentally improve the security when we offer these products to them right um, it's so hard like any user right like if you give them if you give an average user taking an it example if you give them a windows 10 box and expect them to maintain it that's one thing but if you give them a windows xp box and and expect them to you know keep it secure now that's not practical, right? Like you're not yeah. helping them win. So in a lot of these situations, industrial controls have had that uh, legacy where you know you run these things for 25, 30 years, and they were never built with security in mind. So you know they got they got a piece of cheese. So you're trying to you know tell them to protect the cheese. Like how is that possible, right? My my dad is a SCADA engineer for a local utility. And he was like, I got in there and he just, he's put so much security in because he's actually a very security centric person. And um, he tells me about the things that he does. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Cause yeah, like, he's a, a star, not, like uh, very few that we have, you know? Yeah. Cause for you guys, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You guys are probably getting a dozen hits a day from people trying to take you down. You know, I'm just ping him a little bit and see how it's going. So it really is very, very crucial for ICSs right. specifically. The next challenge for him, if you ask him, he'll tell you the same thing. The next challenge for him is where and how can he transition? Like, let's say he gets a promotion and suddenly, you know, there's no one to fill his shoes. So that plan needs a backup plan and they typically don't have it, right? So he can't leave the plant in someone's safe hands because there's no one to take the mantle over from him. That's a challenge we have. Exactly. That that is a problem. Is like people like him are very hard to find. Um, yeah. He'll so he'll probably have to do some succession planning. That's another thing that IT professionals don't do a ton is succession planning. Like um, you know, when I vacated my last pen testing position, I was the only do it person doing all the offensive and security testing at all. And when I left, it fell onto the infosec program manager, who while she had the capability, didn't have the bandwidth. And it took them six months to backfill me. And now that person is still not up to speed. And it's like, you know, the more succession planning you do, like the more planning you do, period, the more prepared you are for when ch changes happen, sudden changes. Right. I mean, you mentioned succession planning and I'll add separation of duties and job rotation. None of these exist <laughs> in the OT world, especially. No, it's just one guy or one gal that knows how this thing works. <laughs> and as long as they're around, you know, you can keep it, you know. Kind and it's of, not even uh, written down anywhere. It's just in his head. So then when it goes <laughs> down, you got to call him and be like. <laughs> Literally someone retired and took the whole InfoSec program with them. <laughs> like they didn't write it down. Um, yeah. 
my tiny unicorn. Um, no, one of the biggest things that gets me is like in all of my security, like academic documentation that we have and like all the teachings that I just completed in my master's, it's like forced vacations, job rotation, like learn a new capability, sh shadow someone new, force them to take vacations. And then in reality, it's like, don't you dare take a vacation. You need two hours for surgery. You get two hours and have your phone on. It's like, we're not enforcing any of that. We're not doing these secure things. I'm we are not doing any of these things that we, at the very basic, say everyone should be doing because we are so short staffed and we are so hyper concerned with like that one person not vacating their post at any cost. Yeah, big challenge for sure. All right, do we have uh, any questions from the audience? I don't know if I see any in the Discord. Someone said amazing presentation. Thank you so much. We all agree that ICS is like a unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's in theme with, uh, with the current GrimCon for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think I should get one of those hats. Uh, is it a hat or a tiara or how do you get that? It's like a headband. It's like a little... Oh, headband. Yeah, there you go. You stole it from I your children. Stole from you get. I stole it. Yeah. I think that's one thing that, you know, if we ever get to meet Bryson in person, you know, given COVID and all, you know, we should ask him to distribute more of these. Yeah. I think all speakers should get a unicorn headband, like for, <laughs> for uniform yeah, purposes. Unicorn headbands instead of, instead of uh, business cards, he just hands those out with his name and number on the porn. That'll be great, <laughs> a little QR code on the back. Ooh, yeah, there you oh, go. There you go, now we're cooking with fire. Might as well throw GPS tracking in it too, you know, and then just make it. <laughs> might as well actually, might as well make that QR code go to a malicious landing page. Where we have a beacon <laughs> listening back. Malicious <laughs> landing I'm just kidding, page. children, don't do that. That's very bad and very <laughs> illegal. Don't do it. Well, you're then forcing people, right? If you get one bad yeah. experience, you learn from it. You're, you're then well, forcing you're, people you're, to deploy all your links on a virtual machine that they can burn <laughs> you're telling them what to do so we do have one comment and it's jason asking you to stick around for the next talk uh which i'm guessing jason is the next talk but <laughs> i'll be happy to i've been really enjoying the conference myself uh I couldn't attend one, but because it's always a challenge, right? Which track you're on. But uh, I've seen like three presentations so far. I really loved it. Awesome. So we still got we got 10 minutes. Would you like to stay in our discussion about tacos? Yes, we are about to have a very San Diego you're, native discussion about tacos. You're, oh, you've you've lived in Houston, so I know you've Absolutely. had at least text me. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. I've had my fair share of tacos and and really good opinions about them too. Ooh, okay, okay. So my favorite taco of all time is still the fish taco. I love a fish taco. Where? From where? <sighs> Don't say Rubio's. No, I mean their bowls are pretty good. They're like they're like pretty good if you got to. Or tacos here, not bowls. I'm probably gonna go with like Wonderland Bar. That's a. Where's that? I don't even know. OB. It's in OB. Ocean right Beach. There at the end of, yeah. Right there at the end of the boulevard where it curves around. Okay. I, I'll ask a simple question point. because uh, that's what was on Twitter this morning. Someone posted and said there should never be an option to have two tacos. <laughs> the whole thread was about you should get a chance to get one taco or three tacos, but no two taco business. Yeah. Why are there taco flights too? I don't want three of one kind of taco. I want one of like, like you have 12 tacos. I want to try multiple tacos. Naturally. I want like a tiny sampler of each of your 12 tacos. You go to, so, so San Diego, if you go to San Diego, you have to go to Tacos El Gordo, right? So Tacos El Gordo, the closest, they were going to build one in Little Italy, but I think the closest one it's closer to the border off of H Street in National City. And I've never been there. You've never been there? I don't think so. They have they have one in, in East County now. That, that's like a brother, but they have Adobada tacos. Those are the best. Those are the best. You know, I, I don't know which ones you like. I mean, so being in, in Houston, right? Being in Texas, 
that there are two distinct groups. So one is the actual Mexican tacos and the other one is Tex-Mex. So um, they also joke about gringo tacos where if you go to a place called Torchies, it's in Austin and in, uh, in Houston, they have special names for these tacos. These are, you know, $5 tacos, not your typical, um, you know, $1 tacos you get, but they have uh, unique names and and either you you love them or you don't right so people that love them because the ambiance the atmosphere is is wonderful and you can pick like uh like she was saying you can pick a platter of completely different tacos one of each kind and uh that way you get to choose everything you know from a weird combination to you know vegetarian to kind of beef okay. you know beef and and fish mix so the the world is your oyster I, I guess that talks about an oyster as well in a taco but i've never tried but i've never had an oyster taco i've had some weird tacos like i've gone straight cabeza and lengua and like you name it so even even uh venturing as far as lumpia which is like a filipino egg roll in tacos that's nice but uh i go tj like i Tijuana style taco is usually what I go for, which is just like little tortilla, a little bit of meat, usually two tortillas and you go in on it. But there's living in San Diego, you just have a plethora of places to go. Yeah. 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 Especially that. I always start with Alpa Store, you know, when I'm when I'm not sure of a new place, I start with Alpa Store. If, it, oh, if yeah. they can make that, because that's the simplest you can make, right? A little bit of pork and a pineapple. Oh, yeah. and if you can make that right, okay, that's a good place. Yeah, Similar no, to how I order a margarita pizza to test an Italian place, order an Alpusto taco to test a taco place. A taco uh, that's, that is a that's that is the key. Uh, <laughs> man, now I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. We don't have a break. I'm over here <laughs> yeah, drinking my second about I'm thinking about tacos. I'm gonna have to Uber Eats myself. There you go. Oh wait, wait, I got an update. One second. So we got Jason going on in the next five minutes. Jason is going recording. Jason, are you in the Discord? Oh, so Jason is here. Oh, he's in here? No, he's not. He's, oh, I'm asking. I think Jason is here, but he's recording. There he is. Okay. Just making sure. I, I just saw an email come in, and I wanted to verify. Now, should I exit this presenter mode and then join as another um Oh, I already, I already stole presenter from you. You're fine. You can stay and hang out. You can have uh, the right stripped away. You can, you can leave. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can stay okay. with us the rest of the talks if you really want. Gotcha. Uh, I'll probably end and join back as uh, just a participant. That way it's cleaner and then I can use my iPad for it. Uh, Thanks for chatting with you all. All right. Yeah, it's awesome having you. Thank you for showing up. Bye now.